Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Hassan uh, Institute in this morning hours of, uh, uh, of Monday. Uh, this is normally us earlier than usual event. Uh, my name is Miles Yu. I'm a senior fellow and the director of the China Center here at Hassan Institute. Uh, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here for a panel discussion on the perils of economic engagement with China or the perils of corporate engagement with China. You know, uh, for too long, for nearly half a century, we uh, engaged China vigorously uh, with this illusion somehow uh, economic trade engagement with China can be and should be separated from uh, politics and the security issues. That illusion came uh, basically crushed uh, uh, recently, and we uh, began to realize uh, our economic and corporate engagement with China also carries uh, enormous uh, political and security risks uh, and challenges as, as well, because uh, those challenges are inherent are inherited in um, in the uh, uh, overall uh, approach to China. Uh, today, today's panel will focus on the important issues regarding uh, U.S. economic engagement with China and what can be done to mitigate the various political risks in this involving landscape. Uh, before we begin the, the program, let me take a, 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 a moment to introduce our uh, esteemed moderator and the panelist, uh, we, each of whom uh, brings a wealth of uh, knowledge and uh, considerable expertise to the table. Uh, first, we have uh, Hudson Institute Senior Fellow, uh, Dr. Thomas Dusterberg. Uh, Tom has a long and a distinguished career as an expert on trade, manufacturing, economics, and foreign policy. Previously, he worked at the Aspen Institute and served as the leader for a variety of government and private organizations dedicated to economic research, public policy, and education, including the Washington Office of the Hudson Institute, Assistant Secretary for International Economic Policy at the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, Chief of Staff to uh, Representative Chris Cox, and Senator Dan Quayle. He's the author of four books and well over 300 articles in journals and major news outlets. Tom has been a major contributor to the China Center's research on the Chinese economy. Uh, next, we have Hudson Institute's own uh, senior fellow, Dr. David uh, Asher. David has a well-established career of service in numerous positions at the U.S. State Department, where most recently in 2020, he advised and supported investigations into nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons proliferations and development issues. And he played a very critical role in the State Department's efforts of looking into the origins of COVID-19 and the role of the Chinese government. It's from David that I personally uh, first uh, learned the phrase and the significance of uh, uh, gain of function. Uh, he's an expert on those kind of issues. So. Uh, uh, David is well known at the national, as the national leader for coordinating the U.S. government's sanctions on, how, on the two uh, rogue nations, uh, North Korea and the Iran, in several administrations since 2000. Uh, he, he has worked closely with the National Security Council, State, the State Department, uh, U.S. Special Operations Command, and the U.S. Central Command on sanction policy and implementations. David is Hudson Institute's resident and a vocal expert on sanctions. Also with us today is Mr. Gabriel uh, Noroha, Ro Norona. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, that's right, like Corona, uh, the beer, not the virus. Uh, uh, he's the executive director of Polaris National Security. Over the past two years, Gabriel has become a leading adv advisor to Congress on national security policy, and he has testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on sanctions policy. His research on Iran, Russia, and China has been cited in dozens of letters, statements, testimonies, and pieces of legislation by the Senate and the House. Previously, Gabriel served as a special advisor for the Iran Action Group at the U.S. State Department and directed the department's communications and congressional affairs for Iran. Before that, he worked as a special assistant for the Senate Armed Services Committee under Chairman John McCain and uh, James Inhofe, helping write 
negotiate and pass the annual national security legislations, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA. Uh, welcome to Hassan Gabriel. Thank you. Last and the best, uh, moderating today's panel, uh, we have uh, uh, a very special and very distinguished guest, uh, Ms. Morgan Ortegas. Uh, uh, Morgan is the founder of Polaris National Security and host of the Morgan Ortegas Show on Sirius XM Radio. Uh, she's also a principal at the Rubicon Founders, a healthcare investment firm, and serves as an officer in the U.S. Uh, Navy Reserve. Go Navy, Lieutenant Ortegas. Uh, Morgan is a personal friend of mine and from 2019 and to 2021. This looks like a uh, State Department reunion now. Uh, uh, she served as a spokesperson for the U.S. Department of State, working closely with the White House on the historic Abraham Accords and led U.S. government efforts to push back against the sophisticated Chinese, Russian, and Iranian malign influence campaigns. Uh, and many of you don't know this. Uh, in the State Department, uh, Morgan is known uh, at the inner circle uh, on the seventh floor as FOL, uh, Face of Liberty. She's a spokesperson uh, uh, representing U.S. government to the rest of the world. Morgan previously worked at the Department of Treasury as an intelligence analyst, and from 2010 to 2011, she was uh, the Deputy U.S. Secretary Attaché to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In 2007, Morgan spent several months in Baghdad, Iraq, at the U.S. AID mission, and was a national security contributor to the Fox News. Uh, we're also we're so glad to have all of you here. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, our distinguished panel. <laughs> On a particular note that the views expressed here by the panel uh, are their own. They do not necessarily represent the views of the Hassan Institute nor uh, are, are they the China centers. Uh, before we begin with our slate of questions today, I'd like to uh, turn to Morgan uh, to our, and, a uh, and a panelist to provide some opening remarks on today's topic the perils of corporate engagement with China. So what I'd like to do is uh, maybe uh, start with, with Tom and go this way, and each of you will have a, uh, a brief uh, overall uh, statements on this topic, and then maybe uh, uh, up, to, up to five minutes. You don't have to use up five minutes. Uh, Tom? OK. Please. Thank you. Can you all hear me well? OK. Um, I'm going to try to just set the table a little bit with some basic information about why it's difficult to do business in China and why it's a little bit perilous to, to do business in China and to invest in China. So the, the, the overall theme of my remarks is lack of transparency and a lack of rule of law. So in terms of companies operating in, in China, and I know we have some companies represented here in the audience who probably know more about this than I do, uh, but maybe we can get into that in the discussion. Uh, I just have a list of problems in operating the way you would in uh, the West. First, there's no reliable macro data uh, for guidance about where the Chinese economy is going. Um, for instance, you can't get re reliable unemployment data. Uh, second, there is no reliable, enforceable rule of law. I note that the date today, December 18th, is the date that the trial of uh, Jimmy Lai is being started in, has started, I guess, this morning, our time, uh, in Hong Kong. Lai is a British citizen. Um, it's unclear what the, his, uh, his crime was, but here he is, he's being, he's being tried. Um, <laughs> So I would also note that uh, Chinese partners of American firms or Western firms in general uh, can't always be relied on in a number of ways. We have this example of Arm Holdings. Uh, this Chinese subsidiary basically took their IP, um, set up a, a, a separate company in China. There's also a, a well-known prevalence of intellectual property theft an inability to enforce IP rights through the court system uh, in China. I personally know a good number of executives who have done business in China and who have uh, shown me, uh, for instance, the plans that they stole from another automaker and asked them to um, produce those, uh, those actually parts for autos 
or um, I know high tech executives who um, basically, uh, as soon as they set up an operation in China, um, saw their IP basically stolen. Um, next thing I note is the presence of the Chinese Communist Party on management committees. This is a requirement of operating in China. Not all companies are dominated by that in any means, but they're watched uh, very rigorously. Um, I'd also note that um, the, the utility services that are available in China are sometimes unreliable. I mean, Beijing shuts down when the pollution is, is, is too, ba too, too, uh, too bad. Um, electric and uh, water utilities are sometimes unreliable. Um, another thing I would note is there is a uh, legal requirement to keep data generated by a business in China uh, on Chinese servers um, and a diff sometimes difficulty in transmitting that back, back to home headquarters. I don't know how well General Electric does with its jet engines uh, operating in China. Uh, they need uh, real-time uh, data transmission uh, to make sure that they're operating the way they, they should. Uh, I would also note that there is, a uh, under Xi Jinping, a very widespread anti-corruption campaign uh, going on that can affect at least the workers of uh, uh, foreign companies in China in, some, in an unpredictable manner. Um, I would also note that domestic employees in China don't always have good, reliable government uh, services, uh, pensions, health care, public services at the local level are all stressed at, uh, in a very big way at the moment um, and unreliable uh, to do the sorts of things that they do in, in Western companies. And just quickly, I wanted to note a few things about uh, individual or uh, um, um, investment fund investors in China that are problems. First is the well-known problem of uh, the ownership structure of, of stocks in China, variable interest entities. You don't own the rights to the stock. Um, so it's not firm ownership, and it hasn't really been tested yet. But uh, in, a, in a pinch, I would not, uh, not be confident that my ownership could be well protected. Um, second, it's extremely hard to do due diligence um, on companies in, in China. Um, there's unreliable audits uh, that have, uh, despite efforts by uh, our uh, Securities and Exchange Committee, Commission and the PCAOB, um, the, um, uh, those two entities recently uh, um, fined uh, a bunch of auditing firms, America, including American audit firms operating in China for totally ina inadequate um, reports on the, the, the performance of companies in China. Uh, again, I would note for investors, there's unreliable macroeconomic data to guide the investments. Um, finally, I would note that um, uh, in, in terms of uh, Selling uh, bonds in China again. There's unreliable macroeconomic data, and uh, but also um, there there is uh, little protection for uh, foreign firms in the sense that, uh, for instance, in the property sector, there have been a massive number of defaults of bonds for the cr cratering uh, property sector. And almost all of them to start out with have been dollar bonds. And it's difficult then uh, to um, resolve those in bankruptcy court. Um, so that uh, has led the debt investing firm SC Lowy to find Chinese credit, as they say, uninvestable. So let me stop there, and we can deal with the political implications of that and further on. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, I'll just continue by trying to amplify the, the sheer danger that exists for foreign investors in China today, in communist China. Let's never forget that. Uh, the U.S. has about, uh, the, the estimates range between 300 and $500 billion in hard direct investment in China, uh, more if you adjust it for market prices, because some of these investments were made back in the you know, 80s and 90s, and prices uh, 
of the value of those assets that they own have gone way up. Um, that's more than double what China has invested in the United States. Um, some people uh, see uh, a situation where we have limited leverage over China in the, invest of a, in, in the event of an economic uh, conflict. I will challenge that. Um, but I do want to stress that uh, what has happened to U.S. assets and investments in Russia could well be the fate of U.S. investments in the mainland PRC. And that we're just going to have to be prepared for that reality. Um, already, there's signs of a significant crackdown on foreign uh, direct investment by the Chinese government. Xi Jinping, in early 2021, uh, stated as he ramp, prepared to ramp up an investment crackdown, we must strengthen the institutionalized construction of national security guarantees, borrow from other countries' experiences, study how to s set up necessary glass doors, add different locks at different stages, and effectively handle every type of national security issue. So what he meant by this is he wants to be able to put controls on people's ability to get their money out of China. Already, no foreign investor is, uh, as we sometimes joke, safe in China. SAFE stands for the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, which already has draconian power over the ability of foreigners to move capital out. In fact, today, if you try to get your capital out of China, you have to pay a 25% enterprise income tax with carry-forward losses, set aside 10% of after-tax income to a corporate reserve fund. Uh, if you're paying dividends, you have to pay an additional 10% tax. And if we're pay trading profits, you have to produce a tax compliance audit from a certified public accountant, which is basically a shakedown by the Communist Party of uh, American and other foreign investors in, in China. China's longstanding capital control powers have been expanded significantly in the last uh, few years. In 2020, there was an update uh, in January to the foreign exchange and uh, foreign investment law allowing uh, Beijing uh, to <clears throat> nationalize foreign investments under so-called special circumstances, including war, as one key legislator uh, explained. In 2021, in June, uh, Beijing passed a new counter-foreign sanctions law, which Miles is, of course, one of the most uh, 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 famous recipients of. They've actually sanctioned my own colleague here and a valued friend. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'll be on the list uh, eventually. Um, uh, but it allows the uh, Chinese government the ability uh, with wide discretion to seize foreign companies' assets, detain expatriate employees, uh, uh, and, 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 and engage in uh, other arbitrary acts uh, for anything that Beijing dis de deems discriminatory. It's hard to understand exactly what that means. Basically, they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, to whoever they want. And that's the key thing. Joint ventures and other partnerships are, are already subject to the risk of wholesale expropriation with scant legal recourse. Um, and then um, in the anti-foreign sanctions law passed in, Jan in June 2022, and under Article 3, it authorizes the promulgation of countermeasures against foreign discriminatory restrictive measures uh, that violate international laws and norms. And these are norms dictated by the Communist Party. Their norms are hardly our norms. Um, so basically, the Chinese government has ramped up for a ca not just a capitalist crackdown, but a communist crackdown against capitalism in China uh, carried out by foreign firms. And um, I think this is going to be a hallmark of what we see uh, in 2024 as tensions ramp up between the U.S. and China over Taiwan in the wake of the election in Taiwan that I don't think will, anybody will see as uh, re resulting in an uh, adequate outcome for democracy and freedom. Uh, the bottom line is the U.S. needs to prepare for economic warfare with China, including the likelihood of a Russia-style expropriation of capital, factories, IP, and indeed the imprisonment of employees. This sounds daunting and undoubtedly will be painful, but hard delinking from communist China would not be the end of the world. China is hardly the largest recipient of American foreign direct investment. People think it is. It's, it's not. Um, the Europe, Europeans are way out ahead of that. Um, in any event, based on Xi's actions over the last few years, China has become, in effect, uninvestable in my mind, a reality that U.S. companies are just going to have to live with. So. Gabe, pass to you. Um, your comments build nicely on what I was going to say, so I'll, I'll, I'll steal some of your some of your points. I think it was it was very poignant when we saw um, Xi Jinping come to San Francisco last month um, for an event. At, I believe it was a high 
uh, ballroom where tickets were going $2,000 a plate. Um, and the room was completely packed with corporate executives um, who gave Xi Jinping a, a standing applause and multiple rounds of applause throughout his remarks. Um, this is someone who has put over a million Uyghurs in concentration camps, um, whose government has stolen the data of millions of Americans, built islands in the South China Sea. I don't have to go, that, go throughout the rest of that list. And one of the things that it, that it should worry all of us is how they have co-opted um, corporate, uh, corporate America to serve their ends rather than have us serve our ends. Um, and there was a interesting divide in Congress uh, this month over debate whether we should uh, invest more in China, whether, the, whether we should have outbound investment controls. And, and some in Congress were arguing this will give us the leverage in the relationship by expanding our, our corporate reach into China. And all the evidence we've seen shows that the CCP is doing everything it can to prevent that outcome and, in fact, subvert it so that they serve uh, their ends, not ours. And, and the Russia example is, is very useful to see how this notion of economic peace, interdependence, um, has completely failed. And there's, in, if you go to any undergrad class, you learn the McDonald's theory of peace, where two countries of McDonald's haven't fought each other. And here what we saw was all the McDonald's buildings emptied out, and they've been uh, co-opted into a Russian brand now that has taken all their real estate. And uh, this is just a, a brief harbinger of, of what would happen uh, in the China situation. I think a, a good example to see how it could influence our political system is what happened with Russian imports and exports of titanium. Airbus, which is um, one of the largest importers of Russian titanium, um, went to the EU and basically got it to block all sanctions on Russian titanium uh, because they used part of it in, in some of their air wings. And even though titanium was one of their largest revenue sources for the Russian government, um, because they had inculcated dependence on, fr from European firms, those European firms acted as their protectors in the, in the European political system. The same is going to be far more true when it comes to the United States and uh, Chinese economic issues in the event of conflict. Um, and what we have at Polaris uh, National Security have done is put together a report of the top 10 companies whose conduct has really compromised the US national security or American values in the process of trying to do more business in China. Uh, and so we actually have, uh, over there, we have QR codes where you can, where you can download that report um, we'll probably get a little bit more into that in Q&A. But a few takeaways that we noticed in our research, how much these companies um, have lobbying budgets and political contributions in the United States and the degree to which they have lobbied against legislation that puts more pressure on the Chinese government, that puts pressure on uh, the Chinese human rights violations, for example, the Weaker um, Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, and how they are going out of their way to try to preserve business as usual. Um, and ultimately, there's the, there's the perils of corporate engagement with China for companies, but there's also the perils of corporate engagement to the United States, to our own national security interests. Um, and, and the more we've, look, we've, we've looked into this, we really are worried um, that, the, that the more dependent we are, we lose all ability to fight an economic fight with China to have a systematic sanctions and economic warfare campaign with them. Um, and we are losing that fight, and it is getting worse. And what we should do is, first, we recognize the problem. Second, prob second act is to stop digging. Uh, and so our report is hopefully trying to uh, encourage companies to take that part and, and stop digging. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to keep my remarks short. Um, first of all, I know that we have a lot of people that are watching online. So thank you to everybody who are in the room. Um, thank you to the Hudson Institute. This is my second event with Hudson, I think, within a week. Um, we were here last week uh, on a very different subject, uh, highlighting Hamas atrocities in Israel. Um, but as I learned, as Miles and I learned, uh, working directly for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, you don't get to sit on one subject. You have to cover the whole world. Um, and I'm enormously grateful as somebody who's now on my 
fourth presidential administration that I've worked in, gosh, that makes me feel old, um, uh, working in this administration, of course, in the reserves, but I, I'm so grateful in the Trump administration that President Trump and Mike Pompeo were able to change the consensus, the bipartisan consensus in Washington on the threats related uh, coming from the Chinese Communist Party. And Thomas and David, you were both talking about this for years, but I think that there has been um, a sea change thanks to the hard work uh, of our administration and people like Miles uh, who, who were focused on this every day. Um, so again, thank you to everybody who is listening in. Um, as Miles said earlier, one of the things that I have finally convinced some radio and TV producers is that people do care about foreign policy. Who knew it only took Biden starting World War III to let them finally give me my own foreign policy and national security show? Um, so I invite all of you to listen every Sunday, 11 to 1. Um, Miles was just on. We'll get that interview out. We'd love to have you two on. But I think this discussion that we're having today, and, and again, I know people are tuning in online, this is really important because as Americans, I know that they are worried about China. Uh, they are worried about what our corporations are doing, but they don't quite know what we can do to stop it. And so we want to empower the American people today to, to understand from the expertise on this panel what they should write to their elected representatives about, what they should push for uh, as Americans. And, and if, if nothing else, if I, I think Gabe brought up Xi Jinping being in San Francisco. If we look at the dichotomy of those of us who have been in national security uh, and, and who have worked on, on China issues, if we, if we look at what we're all going to say today on this panel, and then we look at what our top corporate leaders were doing just a few weeks ago by giving a standing ovation to Xi Jinping, I don't know if there's a, a, a better visual than we can paint uh, of the um, of the cognitive dissonance between the national security establishment uh, and the economic and financial leadership of this country, um, and it's I think that we are on a collision course, and we have to find a China policy that's best for the American people. So, David, I want to start with you and just sort of lean in uh, on. Where the I think we all know where the Trump administration, where we stood on this, and, and our fights on China policy were quite public. But let's talk about the strategy, uh, uh, the economic strategy towards China from the Biden administration. It seems that they very much care about climate change and getting concessions uh, out of the CCP. It seems that they do very much care about our national security, and they have uh, you know Austin and, and the military writ large trying to focus on the fact that Xi Jinping is getting the PLA ready for 2027, as we all know. Um, and so they, they, do seem, they do seem to care about national security. They seem focused on Taiwan. But at the same time, they want to sort of have a status quo economic relationship with China. So we're going to try to uh, counter you militarily and from a national security perspective. But we also want you to really keep buying all of our stuff, please. Um, is that strategy going to work? Uh, will appeasement work? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, it never has. I mean, you know, I really encourage everybody to just watch these videos of, uh, of the great leader Xi uh, that have emerged in the wake of the last party uh, Congress and, you know, him driving around in a limousine looking like uh, a North Korean. I mean, I was in charge of North Korea policy <laughs> in the Bush administration uh, and uh, have dealt with the North Koreans many times, including advising the Trump administration on North Korea. And I, you know, having directly interacted with North Korean uh, leadership elements myself and having interacted with Chinese leadership, this is a total sea change. This is like the rise of, I mean, it's sort of like the early rise of Adolf Hitler, actually. I mean, we haven't seen the genocide, but the, the, that will happen in the form of a conflict with the U.S. And, and, and Japan, most likely, over Taiwan. And I wouldn't count the South Koreans to be totally divorced from a conflict, because North Korea will probably pop into it. Um, we've got to be prepared for uh, more than economic warfare with, uh, with, with Xi Jinping. We've got to be prepared for outright warfare. And um, uh, I, I, that's where all the signs are showing. It could be before 2027, too, actually. I mean, if I were them, there's a strike early strike in a surprising way sort of strategy that could occur as early as next year. I see certainly the economic preparations, the capitalist crackdown. Let me just put this in conclusion. I mean, China's capitalist renaissance has been a thing to behold, having been going there for 34 years, including before Tiananmen. It's been destroyed. 
it's not just Jim Eli being locked up. And he was not just a, 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 a great fan, an individual who supported freedom for Hong Kong. He was a, he was a capitalist. He's a, he was a very successful businessman. Um, and he's been skewered. And so have uh, so many others. It's become, uh, uh, as Desmond Shum says, it's become a casino. This is not a, this is not a government you can work with as a, you know, and we're seeing this with the uh, due diligence firms being locked up legally. And, and, and we know having worked together in the treasury and in and, and, and the Middle East where the compliance issues are very thick, they're very, they're very important because of terrorism finance. There, there are certain compliance issues you have to do in any country and you can't do effective investment in China without due diligence. Right now there's no ability to do due, due diligence. It's been treated as espionage. So if that's, what, if that's what's going to be happening, then we have to basically prepare here and now for a China that is, as I mentioned, uninvestable. And that means that we have to be ready to walk away and understand that uh, uh, the, the fortunes that have been made in China when they are, are fortunes that were made in the past, and they're not going to be made in the future. It's just reality. Thank you so much. Um, Thomas, you know, when you look at it from, I, I used to work uh, for a very, one, one of the big four, I'll say it that way, <laughs> one of the big four auditing and consulting firms. And when we were taking, uh, when we were helping companies with their international expansion, uh, we were very good um, at the quantitative side of, if you want to buy this oil field in Tunisia, here's the economics behind it. One of the things that uh, I think companies now realize is that addition to the quantitative analysis, they need to have the qualitative analysis. What are the political risks? What are the regulatory factors? So if you're a company uh, that's looking at doing business and selling a widget in China, I, I think that your, um, your quantitative analysis is certainly different from 20 or 30 30 years ago, whenever you just saw all of the opportunity. But certainly, the political risk is much different now. Uh, how would you help companies understand the political risk and the regulatory uh, environment of doing business today in China? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think there are two factors that I, I would emphasize. I mean, one of them is simply from an uh, ec economic uh, point of view, the, the, the type of business that uh, the Western world um, uh, put into place uh, after the Second World War and is fairly widely accepted um, with things like due diligence, uh, transparency, uh, some element of reciprocity in the, the economic relationships has, as, as David has said, this has been totally undermined. I think you just have to look at, um, uh, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the dinner in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago where she had at his feet, literally at his feet, uh, some of the, uh, the major leaders of American business. Did she give them any hope that policy was going to change, that the, some of the problems that we've outlined here would be changed? Not at all, which is quite extraordinary because he had an opportunity to make some you know, concessions to win back their confidence. Uh, and I found that extremely interesting. So the other thing is uh, David emphasized the, the national security angle of this. And I think what uh, Western firms always have to be aware you know, of the uh, civil military fusion strategy uh, that now dominates China. It's not only that you know, the arbitrariness where um, she and, and the PRC, the CCP leadership, could uh, undermine the, the business of their most successful entrepreneur, Jack Ma. Um, they can use um, the legal structure, David alluded to some of this, to uh, you know, capture uh, the, the business uh, secrets of, uh, of companies and, uh, that are invested there. I mean, American companies are unfortunately going, going ahead full steam on things like investing in artificial intelligence and quantum computing research in, in China. That's immediately going to go go to China. Someone mentioned civil uh, 
uh, civil aviation. We continue to sell engines and avionics to the Chinese, uh, so they're building up you know, not only commercial uh, competitors to Boeing and Airbus, but that technology is going, you know, it's the same companies involved in the commercial sector or involved in the military sector in, in, in China. So we have to be aware of that. It's not only uh, economically risky, but it's risky from a national security point of view. You know, on that uh, note, and this is for any of you, or, or maybe Gabe, having worked on uh, the Senate, might know it, but um, you just talked about investing in AI and and other, you know, critical uh, sectors in China. And we, from my understanding, just completely watered down the provisions that we had uh, on the Hill uh, that were going to uh, much more restrict uh, U.S. investment uh, outflows. And, and, and from what I understand, and I'd love someone to explain this to me and all of us, basically most of those restrictions got tossed out in the NDAA. Can, Gabe, do you want to take that on? So the, there was a debate uh, basically between the Senate and the House. Uh, the Senate wanted a strict outbound investment review process uh, for, for U.S. investments into China. Uh, and the House Financial Services Committee um, really actually surprisingly across the board, um, both the chairman and all the subcommittee chairmen um, said, we don't not just disagree with this, we vehemently disagree with this. We think this whole premise is, is, is bogus and we're gonna block the inclusion of all the legislation into the, into the NDAA. Um, ultimately in the Senate, in Congress, uh, the rule is if you have to have four corners agreement, all, both sides, Democrat, Republican, need to agree to something. Um, and so without that kind of agreement, uh, you're not going to see that legislation go through. And frankly, with, with this view in the House, you're probably not going to see it go through ever um, if, if the opposition is that strict. That's, that's incredibly frustrating, especially hearing what Thomas just said. Well, Gabe, that wasn't my original question for you, but I knew that that was really timely considering um, the NDA passage uh, last week. Uh, but actually, Gabe, and so Gabe runs Polaris National Security. Uh, with me, we worked in the Trump administration together, um, and he is, we're incredibly lucky to have him. Um, and Gabe, you have done all, all of the uh, research with our team um, on this report. Uh, that you're putting out today. So first of all, can you tell everybody where they can find the report to make sure if they want to look at it? And then if you want to just explain um, the thought process behind um, how we identified these companies and, and also if there's a few examples that you'd like to give. Sure. So if you go to uh, our website, Polaris, P-O-L-A-R-I-S-U-S.org, we will have that report up later today. Um, you can sign up for our, our uh, website updates and you'll get it in your inbox right away. Um, so what we call, we call the report the Red Ten, and it's not just about the companies with the most revenue in China. Um, we're, you know, companies can do business in China. That's not necessarily the problem. The problem is when you start repeating and promulgating uh, CCP propaganda, when you start um, urging your employees around the world to shut up about anything involving uh, China that doesn't go across the line. Um, or most egregiously, when you do things that actually support um, the, the People's Liberation Army. Um, the, two, the two companies that actually hit the top of the list are ones that have either supplied technology or advice to the CCP um, for these endeavors. Um, number two is Airbus, um, which I think we were talking about airframes. Um, Airbus is supplying 200 passenger jets um, that could be very easily retrofitted to serve as airlift capacity. They're sending helicopters that could be um, refitted to uh, facilitate the invasion of Taiwan. Um, and then number one is McKinsey, um, which even though they have a lot of uh, corporate uh, contracts with the US government, with the Department of Defense, they've simultaneously been doing work with the People's Liberation Army, um, advising the company that was uh, ca conducting out the creation of the islands in the South China Seas and so you have a company which is, one, trying to do classified work with the US government, but also doing work with our number one geopolitical adversary. This is the problem when you are trying to undermine, ultimately, our national security to advance, uh, to advance the corporate bottom line. It's not sustainable. Um, it's not something that um, they're even trying to hide the ball on in many instances. Um, more and more companies are acting fairly brazenly whether it's um, renaming Taiwan in their corporate materials, whether it's um, kick, the NDA kicking out 
uh, saw people with signs that condemn uh, the genocide in Xinjiang. You're seeing companies believe that they can get away with um, subservience to the CCP. And most of the time, they actually do get away with it. And the American consumer isn't penalizing these companies for their, for their work. In the same way that if 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, we had all, there were all these campaigns about free Tibet, um, corporate responsibility, free trade, fair trade. You're just not seeing that level of, uh, of consumer responsibility holding companies account to account for their work with China. Um, and that is something that the public, that lawmakers need to lead the charge on in saying, ultimately, we want our companies to be advancing US national security. They, you cannot serve two masters, uh, as, as uh, wiser men have, have written before. Um, and in this case, uh, you really cannot serve US national security and advance uh, and adhere to all the CCP regulations. Um, some of what, of what Dave was talking about, um, turning over all your financial data to the CCP, turn over user data and analytics, all things that are going to be weaponized by the CCP in the, down the road. So Gabe, I think you hit the nail on the head, is that um, American corporations, the American finance community, will continue to serve two masters until they feel like they can't get away with it. And that's why events like today uh, are so um, important. You know, Thomas, just going back, uh, one of the things that you talked about um, at the beginning of your remarks is the state, uh, the, I would say the faltering state of the Chinese economy. And I'm interested in hearing more from you about that. Uh, we saw Xi Jinping, obviously, in the past year, uh, really, um, uh, you know, citing national security concerns, uh, really take measures in his own economy that were, um, that were draconian and not helpful for growth, and he hasn't been able to stimulate growth. What is sort of the, uh, what is the overall assessment of where the Chinese economy is today? But um, specifically, do you think Xi Jinping will walk back uh, any of these uh, draconian changes he made in the name of national security? Well, I, I mean, to me, that's a simple question to answer. The answer is no. He's, he's proven that he's not going to walk back these, uh, these draconian measures as you characterize it. Um, but the, the, a, a larger point that I would make um, is that, you know, those political um, measures that they have taken, that she has taken, that the CCP has taken over the course of the last 10, 15 years, probably going back even further than that, you know, do undermine, as David characterized it, the, the capitalist tendencies in the Chinese economy totally totally gutted it. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, the Chinese economy has reached a turning point in terms of its ability to, to stimulate growth. They, they do not have the tools that they're uh, available to them anymore, which they've traditionally used to uh, stimulate growth. They're over leveraged. Their local governments are totally, many of them are essentially bankrupt. So they can't keep building bridges and new airports. They've got enough of them. Their investments are totally um, 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 inefficient in terms of creating new growth. Um, they can't rely on consumers to stimulate growth. So to me, that gives us a lot of leverage. Um, I, I, I don't despair that we, we are, uh, that our business community, our government is in thrall to China and they can exercise leverage on us. I think we need to turn, turn that thinking around because we, we have the ability to uh, actually um, uh, do some harm to the, the Chinese model if we want to employ the tools that we have. It's all because they need our capital investment. They need our technology. They, even you know, semiconductors, commercial aviation, they're way behind us. And if we just keep the pressure on, they're not going to be able to uh, build out those industries. So we need to have the confidence that we can take measures that can uh, that are totally legitimate because they're you know, uh, totally in disregard of the rules of, of uh, they've signed up to in the World Trade Organization. 
you know, they steal technology. Um, they're um, hurting our investors by defaulting on, on bonds. They're stealing companies' IP. If we push back on them, we have a lot of leverage that we ought to be using. That's a great point. And, and that goes right into the question I was going to ask you, uh, David. Um, and thinking about if you're a company and you're thinking about supply chain dependency uh, on the CCP, I think that this was a, a vastly different discussion 10 years ago. In fact, I think it was barely talked about uh, 10 years ago. So um, how should uh, companies, especially I, I think on our on our uh, live link, we've got a lot of people around the country who are operating as uh, you know small and medium enterprises looking to grow internationally. Uh, I also hear from conferences that I speak at around the country from major corporates that they're looking at onshoring, they're looking at nearshoring. I think it's gone from theoretical to more companies are actually trying to do this. So help help the big corporates understand their risk of their supply chain dependency on China and also help the SMEs uh, understand, uh, you know, how, how uh, I guess, why they should not take the big leap of going into China. Well, it's harder to it's harder to make the case for the small and medium sized enterprises not going into China uh, in terms of a sales market, but going into China at this stage uh, uh, as a pro uh, offshore uh, alternative for domestic production is not only sort of we'll say downright unpatriotic, but it's it's really not very practical. As I said, I mean you're dealing with a whimsical. Uh, and at the same time, somewhat demonic, demonical, uh, demo, uh, you know, uh, government in Beijing that is, uh, you know, tr targeted capitalism and uh, capitalist success as a communist excess that can't be accepted. Um, it, 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 you know, these are we're not dealing with the uh, old uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping era of, uh, I guess it was black cats and white cats. Uh, yeah, now we're just dealing with red cats. So the black cats and the you know where the where the capitalists, I guess if I recall, I may always get this backward. And the white cats were the communists, or maybe the communists were the black cats. I can't remember. But the point is, they coexisted. That was the key to Deng Xiaoping's success: is that we can be a capitalist economy with the with the communist you know political system. Um, uh, it's been totally sh shredded, and as I mentioned, and and so I think. You know, despite the, and, and moreover, the production advantages of being in China, given the amount of uh, barriers to getting your money out, uh, uh, you know, have to be considered by all sizes of businesses. I mean, you know, those uh, taxes on capital withdrawal that I mentioned apply to small, medium sized, and large enterprises. So the Chinese Communist Party has now instituted uh, Communist Party cell structures inside all the large U.S companies more or less, or they're certainly trying to. Um, that will apply to smaller and medium-sized businesses eventually, too. And, you know, I mean, so just the bureaucracy of having to accommodate that is sort of ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's become sort of Kafkaesque, frankly, the more you look at uh, the way the business system is, is, is functioning in China. And, I, and the biggest litmus test of what's wrong in Beijing is the fact that, as The Economist points out in uh, this uh, last week's uh, at least online edition, I haven't looked in the print version, there may be up to $500 billion being withdrawn from communist China right now by Chinese. They're trying to get their money out like crazy. That's why the Chinese currency's crashed. I mean, it's an outflow issue. They can't, <laughs> you know, so the Chinese are voted, voting with their feet, and it, it could be up to a trillion. And of course, this, uh, this has happened before. We have seen uh, at times when we've seen large-scale uh, outflow. Um, Tom mentioned foreign investors are getting clobbered, they are, uh, on their Chinese uh, bond exposure. Um, they're trying to get their money out. They are su being mostly successful at the moment, but I expect that to soon be cracked down upon. So again, I, I can't, I, I, you know, th there's a lot of other places, uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, there's a lot of other places that we have to, by the way, protect from the Chinese, uh, the Philippines particularly, um, that are attractive Asian destinations for, if for production. Uh, if, uh, if if it needs to be supplemented in the United States, uh, I'm still an America first guy, as you know. But uh, I think that the reality is, we, you know, the, 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 even in those Asian alternative sites, there's huge risk. Because what are the Chinese trying to do? They're trying to inflict 
mortal damage on the functioning <clears throat> democracy and, 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 and system of freedom in the Philippines right now. I mean, you know, we could have a war between the U.S. and China over the Philippines in the coming months. It's not a, it's not a, a something you, you could say is out of the money. I mean, it's just the markets aren't priced yet, but I would say it's blatantly obvious this thing could turn into a real fighting war. I think so. If you ask 99.9% of Americans what you just said of that, we could have a war with China over the Philippines in the coming months. That's not on anyone's radar. No, really. It's incredibly important. Um, we could have another hour long session on that, but we only have 10 minutes left. Um, and so, Gabe, one of the things that I hear, uh, you know, whenever I am talking to corporate, you know, CEOs who are who are doing business in China, who have large operations there, um, is they feel like they are somewhat insulated from pressure from the CCP from Xi Jinping and others, because they employ uh, so many uh, Chinese citizens. So they think, well, they're not going to, you know, they, everyone always thinks they're the last one that's going to get cracked down on. Well, it's not going to be me because I have leverage over them because I employ so many of their citizens. Can you sort of dispel uh, that fallacy for our CEOs and, and any other fallacies that CEOs may have uh, about why they are the ones to be actually insulated from CCP pressure? So first, I, again, I think I, I really find the Russia example illustrative because um, it, if we don't pay attention to how deterrence failed on the economic side yeah. there, we will completely fail on the economic deterrent piece when it comes to Taiwan or Philippines or anywhere else. And, and there, the Biden administration said, hey, we have a whole list of aggressive sanctions that will come into place the moment you invade Ukraine. Putin either saw the list through intelligence and decided it wasn't credible enough um, or um, really just simply from precedent said, we're not worried about it. And so part of the issue there is, are we sending a clear enough signal publicly that, uh, that China will be afraid to do this? Um, and are we going to put enough things in that initial sanctions package that you can get corporates actually going and lobbying Beijing and saying, hey, we don't want uh, we don't want this uh, prohibition on, on something coming into place if you invade Taiwan. Um, the issue is, what if we put that list out and then they go and lobby Washington to water it down instead of going and lobbying Beijing not to start Which the they war. were pretty successful with last week. Yes, and, and so that's, that's my concern there. Um, and so I think if you're, the, if you're the CCP, you're going to, you don't have that compunction. You don't have the same lobbying problem that we do. And so they're not going to be able to go and make the case to Beijing that you should save some of our, our jobs so that if, if there's even a trace element of idea that will harm their own national security. They can, again, make edicts without, with the paramount issue of national security, and everything else will be subordinated to it. We just have different political systems where those, inf where those abilities to lobby and make that case uh, don't exist in that, in that system. And, I think, again, you look at other countries, you look at Venezuela nationalizing assets, you look at Russia, even Mexico nationalizing um, various assets. And if you think that the Chinese are going to give you a leeway because there's 20,000 jobs in your country, that's, again, the issue is it's just a tiny print pick in the overall economic system. 20,000 might be a big thing to say the economy of New Hampshire, but if you're looking nationwide, it's, it's not going to do enough. And most of the companies that, that we're looking at that have the most strategic problems, they have thousands of employees, but with the exception of Foxconn, which is Apple's supplier, um, none of them are even hitting 100,000. Uh, Foxconn is about 300,000 in China. The rest are not hitting a systemic level where they're going to make, uh, where they're going to be able to convince Beijing that they're worth saving. Um, well, we've got just about five minutes left, so I want to quickly ask all three of you two questions. We are going to end on a happy note, because I feel like every time I talk about foreign policy, I go through all the dire things around the world. And like you, David, I'm still America first, and I just you know, still believe we're the good guys and we're going to win in the end. Maybe not with Generation Z, but well, God bless it. We have some work to do there. Um, but um, maybe it's because David and I both have a sanctions background, but uh, it, 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 struck out, it struck to me whenever he talked about the um, increased risk of conflict over um, the Philippines. Uh, but also, I've been saying for the past year, if you were Xi Jinping, why would you not 
uh, invade Taiwan next year after the elections, depending on what Why would you wait for Trump to come back? That's, that's not a smart choice. So maybe it's just me. I'm glad you think so, David. But I'm curious for all three of you, sort of uh, rate what you think or, or, or you know, quantify, however you want to do it, um, assess what you think the risk is of, of China actually taking some sort of uh, military action, whether it be over Taiwan, the Philippines, whatever it might be uh, in 2024. And we'll start with you, Thomas. Well, I, I don't claim to be a, an expert on uh, military uh, uh, strat strategy or technology. Thomas, that hasn't ever stopped anyone in Washington <clears throat> from opining. I, so. I know, so I'll, I'll give you my opinion. I, I, I'm less uh, sure that they're going to do anything in the, in the near future. And I, I go back uh, a bit to history. You know, last time China f fought a... Uh, a hot war was in, with Vietnam and whenever that was about 40 years ago and they got their nose beaten a little bit um, on, on that uh, and she has been going about in this anti-corruption campaign has reached the highest levels of uh, Chinese military leadership uh, and um, I don't see how they re recover in terms of command and control very quickly from that and I also think she is probably worried that if, if a conflict breaks out, um, he's going to have to fight not only us, but the Taiwanese, the Japanese, uh, and the South Koreans. And he, I think he fears the, uh, the military prowess of, of all of those countries. So Thomas so, is not as worried about it. David? I'm more worried about covert action uh, being combined with overt action against Taiwan. Uh, covert would be uh, to uh, start to engage uh, uh, dissident elements in, in Taiwan, which do exist, to uh, you know back assassinations, um, to 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 deal with um, uh, you know very significant breaches of Taiwan's national security apparatus. Uh, 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 you know. And, and, and to start to see um, the rebirth, uh, even in the wake of a DPP victory, which could occur, but it's not going to occur with the DPP and the LY, the legislative branch. Uh, they're not going to get anywhere near a victory, as far as I know, they're there. And so, you know, Taiwan's going to be somewhat subverted internally by its own politics. It's, 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 and it's been there for before, but it's going to be worse, I think, in the next year. I think that she will prey on that. I think an economic and digital sort of blockade. Uh, he could just cut off uh, Chinese exports to Taiwan of food, for example. I mean, there's a lot of things he can do. I think he'll start to upset the situation. I think the chance of a conflict, though, is remarkably high. And it's mostly by Chinese uh, reckless actions. It was just recently we had a US B-52, could have been armed with nuclear weapons, yeah. coming from Guam, you never know. It's how they potentially are uh, uh, flying. Uh, it was almost collided uh, by, with by a Chinese fighter. It came within 10 feet of hitting it. That could have been the biggest nuclear crisis uh, in the history of, of Asia, um, something like the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the way that you take down a nuclear-armed uh, US B-52, right. all hell would have broken loose. And that could happen, please. Uh, you know, for me, there's three sort of dates which worry me. There's the Taiwan election. Um, especially, I think if DPP is elected and and there's sort of more anti-China rhetoric that China that the CCP tries to counteract that uh, with threats, I think our transition in January 2025 potentially, uh, if there's if there's a new president coming in, that's a time of you, of the Chinese seeing instability and turnover as a good opportunity, and then the next party congress in, in 2027, those sort of those being the three sort of key dates where I sort of see. Um, there being either insecurity or the sen in, in China or the sense that there's insecurity here at, here at home, um, being good opportunities um, to take advantage of, of, a, of a situation and, and, and perhaps launch either uh, overt attack or simply just escalating covert measures. Well, I'm going to be, I'm going to play television producer now. So we just have about 20 seconds each left um, in this, uh, in this uh, panel. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here in person and those of you watching online. We're going to get this out on all of my social media, at Morgan Ortegas, at Polaris Natsek. Um, but just last, you know, 10, sec 10 20 second answer uh, each. We could go down the road and start with Thomas again. Uh, uh, what is the, we've talked about all of the bad stuff today. What is the bright spot, if any, that you see between U.S. and China uh, in 2024? Well, as I 
tried to um, um, articulate that China, the Chinese economy is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Our economy is doing remarkably well. Um, and we can, there's not much China can do, I think, to undermine our economy. We can do a lot to undermine theirs. Do you do the grocery shopping in your family? Is it just says the grocery is the one who goes to the grocery store. Just saying, groceries are pretty high. Everything, but the economy. I take your point. I take relative. your point. <laughs> I made my husband come with me to the grocery store recently because he wanted to know why everything was so high. But I, I agree with you, Thomas. Thank you, David. Um, we have tremendous amount uh, amount of uh, power to inflict against China uh, for its reckless behavior, and should be we should have a sanctions regime on China. We do not have any sanctions regime on China. Yeah. Everything we have sanction wise is derivative of something else like Magnitsky. We don't we need our own China sanctions regime. We're going to be putting out a, a series of reports here at Hudson uh, early next year called Sanctioning China. Uh, and it's going to get into everything from the Communist Party's own structures that could be targeted, Xi Jinping's personal fortune, uh, which does exist despite the fact that it's well hidden. Uh, we'll be trying to identify it. And then we're going to be going after the nuclear, biological, uh, military spa uh, enterprises. Uh, space and and other uh, things as well because there's no sanctions regime. We're letting them go for a shop. They're shopping free in downtown LA for electronics and even where the export controls exist, they're not being enforced. And the report will be called Sanctioning China? That's, 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 that's that is the report I, I want to read. I I, and we're going to have not just, just to make it real quick, we're <laughs> going to have details. It's going to be a whole sanctions regime. You, we've written sanctions before yeah. and worked on them together uh, years ago. Uh, we know it's how to write sanctions uh, 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 the, you know, in the official format. These things will be ready for the Trump administration or whoever comes in next to uh, lift on day one and implement against China. Well, David, you have to unveil that on the Morgan Ortega show. I will look forward to that great opportunity. Um, one, one thing that we used to talk a lot about was how much uh, debt China, uh, U.S. debt that Chinese held. Um, actually, in the past couple of years, that number has decreased from about $1.1 trillion down to about $800 billion. Um, so that um, actually, to me, has some positive signs. Um, that they are that that problem is is less. Unfortunately, it also is a fact that our debt has ballooned, and so it's simply a, a reduced percentage. So a little bright note there. Well, Thomas, uh, David, Gabe, thank you so much. Uh, your incredible colleagues and Miles is you. No one can replace him. Is going to close it out. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, 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 illuminating as well as uh, stimulating uh, panel of discussion. And I think you know, Morgan asked the very uh, cogent question: uh, what, uh, What's the uh, uh, upside? The upside is that the United States has an open market of ideas. And not only that, and also a open market of, of economy. So, uh, and that's basically is ultimately that the reason why we shall prevail, uh, because China, for all the for all practical purposes, is a closed society. Uh, so uh, maybe let me just uh, uh, make some um, uh, uh, do some uh, PSA before I make, uh, share some of my observations. Uh, number one, uh, listen to uh, Morgan Ortega show on <laughs> XM uh, series XM, and also uh, look for the, their uh, report from Paris. It's, it's really excellent. We're going to link our website, and you can look for their website too. Um, and also, some of the issues actually, we do have a uh, a podcast from China Center Hudson. Institute. Um, each week, every Tuesday, we roll out an episode. Some of the issues about Taiwan, about the Philippines, and uh, we will discuss. Uh, we will discuss uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, normally, you will, you'll hear that every Tuesday. So it's called China Insider. Please listen to that. Now, back to my concluding uh, observations. It struck me that uh, um, Gabe and, uh, and several of you mentioned about the uh, the uh, the Munich of American corporate world in San Francisco uh, uh, last month. And in addition to the kind of, you know, uh, to the uh, uh, sort of a circumference uh, uh, there led by some of the leading American corporate uh, entities and individuals, you notice that uh, also in that meeting, there are a lot of uh, key industry and technology leaders who were not there, right? The CEOs of Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, uh, NVIDIA and AMD, they're not there. Now, that absence could be interpreted in, in different ways. Number one, it could mean that uh, they, uh, you know, this publicity with uh, openly uh, uh, closing up with the communist dictatorship is not really that uh, positive image for the business uh, because it's a liability when we talk about uh, a close relationship with China. Secondly, which is not really so benign, 
uh, is that uh, many companies in the American corporate world prefer to deal with China separately and privately. They view their problem with China is just that, their company's problem with China. While the fact that Facebook's problem with China, Google's problem with China, should never be just their problem with China, it should be America's problem with China. So that's why private companies, American corporations, must work with US government to do this at the most systemic and government level, because this is not just the individual isolated cases. So that's my observation number one. Number two, we really have to realize that everything we engage with China, uh, we have to realize the three fundamental realities of the Chinese society. Number one, China essentially is a non-market economy. This is the biggest problem of our time, is that we embrace a non-market economy into a market-oriented global trading system. Allowing a non-market economy of enormous size, well-disciplined to exploit the free market system. And that's the problem. So that's the reality number one. Reality number two is China is a communist country. In other words, there is a communist party that monopolizes all political powers and economic power too. Yes, you have some, some uh, uh, non-state uh, economies that are booming uh, as a result of in limited engagement with the, with the global economy, but the party ultimately can really decide the rise and fall of every individual company. Once your company becomes bigger, the company, the Chinese Communist Party will always move in and to seize everything you will have because there's no constitutionally guaranteed private ownership and property rights in China. That's the problem. So China is a Communist Party. That's why every major American corporation into China, the Communist Party has now insisted to install the party sale inside your, your company there and it to, to allow Chinese uh, Communist Party as a control of personnel and propaganda and through all kinds of coercive you know, uh, me mechanisms there. Number three, we have realized uh, China does have an ambition for global economic technological dominance. No matter what you do, that's the ultimate goal. So your investment, your cooperation with China serves that grand purpose of Chinese Communist Party. They try to create a global dependency on China economically trade-wise as well as technologically, ultimately the Chinese model of governance, the political system that's been practiced inside China will be transplanted through the rest of the world, through that global dependency. So uh, those are my, uh, my concluding remarks and I thank the panel uh, for this. I learned so much uh, from each one of you and uh, uh, phrases like uh, David crystallized the idea of uh, due diligence in China uh, means espionage, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and also, uh, thanks to the audience, and thanks to uh, uh, the people uh, who are uh, watching us online. And uh, until then, uh, see you next time.